So in this section, we'll cover the regulation of the adrenal cortex. So the adrenal glands sit on top of the kidney and has uh, both the cortex and the medulla. The cortex is divided into three zones, zona uh, glomerulosa, which secretes aldosterone, zona fasciculata, which secretes glucocorticoids, and zona reticularis, which secretes an, uh, androgens. Underneath the cortex is the medulla, and that secretes catecholamines, and we'll cover the adrenal medulla at a uh, separate uh, section. And again, if you recall from the introductory section, we mentioned that many of the steroid hormones are derived from the parent molecule cholesterol. And shown on this slide is simply a schematic of that process, where cholesterol can go down the pathway to produce aldosterone in the zona glomerulosa, or cortisol in the zona fasciculata, or testosterone in the zona reticularis. Indicated on the side of each of these is the rate-limiting uh, enzymes, which are important for the conversion of the precursors down to the product. We will cover the dysregulation of each of these enzyme systems in the section on congenital adrenal hyperplasia in the uh, end of this adrenal section. So in terms of um, understanding how cortisol is actually synthesized, this is a schematic of that process. If you recall again, cortisol is regulated primarily by uh, stimulation from ACTH from the pituitary. ACTH binds to uh, a G-protein coupled receptor in the zona fasciculata, which is a GS subunit, which then stimulates CAMP, which in turn stimulates the LDL receptor to uptake cholesterol. And once cholesterol gets into the cell, then it goes down the cortisol synthetic pathway to, uh, to synthesize cortisol, and cortisol in turn is released into the bloodstream. Likewise for aldosterone, in the zona glomerulosa, um, it is also synthesized by cholesterol, but the regulation is entirely different. It is actually regulated by both potassium and angiotensin II. Angiotensin II, again, if you recall, is uh, binding to a G-protein coupled receptor, a GQ subunit, which activates IP3, and the activation of the IP3 then activates the LDL receptor to take up the cholesterol, and then when cholesterol gets into the zona glomerulosa, synthesis of aldosterone occurs. Aldosterone is released into the bloodstream and gets to its site of action. So basically, the systems that we're talking about are the HPA axis, which is the, um, the uh, CRH from the hypothalamus, ACTH from the pituitary, cortisol from the adrenal gland, but also the RAA axis, which is the venin angiotensin aldosterone system. So we'll cover the RAA system first, and then we'll get back to the HPA axis second. So the RAA system is a system that is um, regulated by the release of renin, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, and aldosterone. And this, again, forms a classical negative feedback system. So renin is actually released first from the JGA apparatus, which is the juxtaglomerular apparatus in the kidney, gets to the liver, converts um, or releases angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 gets converted to angiotensin 2 in the lungs by the converting enzyme. And the angiotensin 2 then works on the adrenal cortex, specifically in the zona glomerulosa, as I showed you in the previous slide, activating IP3, releasing aldosterone or synthesizing aldosterone. Aldosterone then works back onto the kidney in the distal convoluted tubule to reabsorb sodium and secrete out potassium. So let's put that feedback system into some context by doing uh, this question. So during an experiment, a 25-year-old man receives an intravenous infusion of angiotensin II at a rate that increases the plasma concentration approximately threefold. Which of the following sets of physiologic changes is most likely in this man? So this question requires you to understand a little bit about the feedback. So remember, again, the feedback system we're talking about is the renin angiotensin II aldosterone system. So if you're in increasing angiotensin II, you're going to be increasing aldosterone. If you increase aldosterone, then the feedback would be to suppress renin. So once renin is suppressed, that is a negative feedback. The other thing to understand is what is the physiological action of angiotensin II? Angiotensin II will result in an increase in the uh, efferent arterio arteriolar resistance. And as a result of the increase in the efferent arteriolar resistance, 
you increase the filtration fraction. And hence, the correct answer for this would be option E, which is the one that produces all three of these. One is a negative feedback, which is the suppression of renin, and the other is the increase in the filtration fraction and the increase in the efferent arterial, arteriolar resistance. Again, to reiterate the actions of aldosterone, aldosterone is synthesized in the zona glomerulosa. It does get secreted out into the bloodstream and makes its way into the distal convoluted tubule in the kidney, where its action is to bind the mineral corticoid receptor. And as a result of that um, binding of the receptor, transcription happens and then translation of, of the protein happens. And one of the main proteins that gets translated is the sodium potassium ATPase which then allows for the absorption of sodium and then secretion of the potassium. As a result of this, the clinical manifestations of hyperaldosteronism is hypertension, hypokalemia, and metabolic alkalosis. Hyperaldosteronism can be divided into both either primary or secondary, depending on what's driving the pathology. So again, if you recall, primary always refers to the problem with the target gland itself. So in this case, primary hyperaldosteronism is referring to something that's going wrong with the adrenal gland itself. And the most common cause for primary hyperaldosteronism is an adrenal adenoma or an aldosterone-producing adenoma. And as a consequence of this, the adenoma overproduces aldosterone. Negative feedback will then suppress the renin. So that's why you will have a high aldosterone, low renin, but the consequence, again, will be hypertension, hypokalemia, and alkalosis. In contrast, secondary refers to a consequence of uh, some other process that's driving the pathology. So in this case, the adrenal glands are responding to something. In this case, responding to an overstimulation of the RAA system. And a classic example of the overactivation of the RAA system would be something like CHF. So in this case, there is the, uh, the primary driver is, in fact, an increase in the renin, which then increases aldosterone, which then subsequently leads to similar clinical manifestation, which is, again, hypertension, hypokalemia, alkalosis. But in this case, you will also have edema. Let's do a question to understand this feedback system a little bit better. 38-year-old woman with hypertension and hypokalemia is suspected of having hyperaldosteronism. In addition to serum aldosterone, initial evaluation of this patient should include the measurement of which of the following. So in this case, it should always include uh, renin. You always want to get a paired aldosterone renin level. And this helps to distinguish between either primary or secondary. Again, if you recall, in the primary case, the problem is the aldosterone itself, and aldosterone is increased feedback system was in place and therefore renin will be suppressed. Therefore, in primary hyperaldo, the aldo over renin ratio will be high and it's typically above 25. Whereas in the secondary situation, the primary driver is in fact the renin itself, which then increases the aldosterone. And so the ratio of the aldo over renin will be low and usually it will be lower than 10. So this would be a simple way to really distinguish between the primary versus secondary hyperaldosteronism. Now let's switch gears and talk about the second axis inside the adrenal gland, which is the HPA axis, and primarily driven by cortisol. So the physiological effects of cortisol can be either metabolic or the more commonly known immunomodulatory effects. Metabolic effects can include um, effects that can lead to diabetes because cortisol actually decreases glucose uptake. It could redistribute uh, fat from the uh, legs to the trunk, leading to central adiposity. It could lead to osteoporosis as because cortisol can increase bone re reabsorption. But cortisol is also helpful in situations where you know, anti-inflammation is needed. So it can attenuate the immune response. It has a potent anti-inflammatory effect. So it's important to make sure that the physiological regulation of cortisol is maintained. And when, once this um, regulation is perturbed, it can lead to pathophysiology, as you will see in the next uh, couple of slides. So first, again, cortisol is secreted like growth hormone in a very pulsatile way and in a, has diurnal variation. So cortisol levels are generally higher in the morning and lower in the evening. And that is why measuring random 
plasma cortisol is of not much use, just like measuring random growth hormone is not much use for diagnostic purposes. Cortisol is again a classical steroid hormone. It binds to the glucocorticoid receptor inside the cytoplasm and uh, it gets escorted by the heat shock protein into the nucleus where it binds DNA, mRNA is transcribed and makes protein and leading to a physiological response depending on the target cell. So remember I told you that the physiological consequences of cortisol are both good and bad and so if the, the, the regulation is perturbed then the pathophysiology ensues. So again the pathophysiology can be as a consequence of too much cortisol or too little cortisol and as shown in this slide is when you have too much cortisol you have a syndrome called Cushing syndrome. This is a manifestation where increased cortisol can lead to um, several manifestations which can be um, the classical buffalo hump, moon facies, uh, diabetes, uh, truncal adiposity, purple striae and so on which are all the classical manifestations of Cushing syndrome. One of the challenges of diagnosing Cushing syndrome is to try to understand the diagnostic testing that's associated with this. So the best way to approach the diagnosis of Cushing syndrome is in a very stepwise manner. There are three steps uh, to try to understand where this, the cause or the source of the excess cortisol is coming from. So the first step in the diagnosis is to ask the question, first of all, is there hypercortisol, hypercortisolism or is there in fact Cushing syndrome? And the best test to do this is to get a 24-hour urine-free cortisol. So again, remember, you don't want to get a plasma cortisol that's sort of random because of the, the diurnal variation and the pulsatile secretion of cortisol. So 24-hour urine cortisol allows you to get an integrated measure of the cortisol over a 24-hour period to really get a sense of whether or not there is a high cortisol state. In some cases, getting a 24-hour urine cortisol may not be feasible. And in those situations, a screening test can be performed using one milligram overnight dexamethasone suppression. And normal situations, when you give dexamethasone, which is a synthetic steroid, and dexamethasone is a steroid that is not made in our bodies, but it's in fact a drug, um, the normal response when you give one milligram of dexamethasone is a complete suppression of uh, plasma cortisol. If that happens, then the, the patient does not have hypercortisolism or does not have Cushing syndrome. If on the other hand you give one milligram dex and the plasma cortisol doesn't suppress, then that patient has hypercortisolism or Cushing syndrome. The second step in the process is to try to understand where is this excess cortisol coming from. Is this coming from the adrenal gland? Is it coming from the pituitary? Or is it coming from another source that's outside the pituitary such as a lung tumor or like a bronchial carcinoid for example? And the, the test that will help distinguish all of this would be to get a plasma ACTH level. Because again, remember, because of negative feedback, plasma ACTH and cortisol levels are reciprocally regulated. So if there's high cortisol, you should have low ACTH. If that is the situation, then likely the source of the excess cortisol is from the adrenal gland. But if the cause is pituitary or ectopic, then it's the ACTH that's driving the whole process and so ACTH levels will be actually quite high. And the final step in this is to distinguish between pituitary versus ectopic. And to do that, you would need to do a high dose dexamethasone suppression test. So unlike the low dose, which only uses one milligram, in the high dose you use eight milligrams of dexamethasone. And this very high level of dexamethasone is thought to suppress the HPA axis. So if the source of the excess cortisol is in fact coming from the pituitary, then the high dexamethasone dose should be able to suppress the HPA axis and should suppress plasma cortisol. And if it does that, then the cause is a pituitary adenoma. But if on the other hand, a high dose dexamethasone is not able to suppress, um, even with using a high, a high dose of dexamethasone, then the cause is an ectopic uh, source. Let's try to put this in, in better context in the next slide, uh, looking at specific laboratory studies. So again, the steps are you want to find out whether or not the patient has hypercortisolemia, and that can be easily accomplished by measuring 24-hour urine-free cortisol. If it's high, then the patient has Cushing syndrome. Then the next step is to try to figure out where is this coming from. If it's a cortisol or, sorry, adrenal-producing tumor, 
or an adrenal uh, source, then the excess cortisol will be matched with a suppressed ACTH because of negative feedback. And if the ACTH is undetectable, then the cause is uh, an adrenal adenoma. And the next step in the process would be to take out that adrenal tumor. If, on the other hand, the ACTH remains high, then the cause can be either pituitary adenoma or an ectopic source such as a bronchial carcinoid or a lung tumor. And in that situation, this, the um, test that you want to do is to get an 8 milligram high dose dexamethasone suppression test. And in the case of Cushing's disease, which is a specific situation associated with pituitary adenoma, the excess cortisol will be suppressed by the high dose dex. But in the case of an ectopic tumor, the excess cortisol is not suppressed by the high dose dex. So that's the important point uh, to remember. The other end of the spectrum of excess cortisol is low cortisol, leading to adrenal insufficiency. And again, just like everything else we've been talking about, the cause can be either primary or secondary. If it's a primary cause, then the disease is called Addison's disease. If it's secondary, then it is likely due to pituitary failure. Biochemical testing can be very helpful in this regard. Adrenal insufficiency, by definition, would lead to low cortisol. But again, if the feedback is intact, then the low cortisol will feed back to the pituitary to result in increased ACTH. That is primary adrenal insufficiency. But if it's secondary, where the cause is a pituitary dysfunction, then the ACTH itself is low, which then drives the low cortisol. So in this case, cortisol and ACTH are both decreased. The common causes of primary adrenal insufficiency or Addison's disease is uh, in, the, uh, in the U.S. is autoimmune Addison's uh, disease or autoimmune uh, adrenalitis. In the rest of the world, the most common cause for Addison's disease is uh, tuberculosis. So any process that can damage the adrenal gland, either by infiltration or a tumor or uh, autoimmune disease, can lead to Addison's disease. The main symptoms are nausea, weight loss, weakness, um, hypotension, and in certain cases, again, if the stress is very severe, can lead to sudden death. But there are two important clinical manifestations that are very unique to primary but not secondary adrenal insufficiency. And those are, number one, hyperpigmentation, and number two, hyperkalemia. The reason for the hyperpigmentation is, again, goes back to the POMC gene that we talked about in the introductory section. So remember, alpha MSH and ACTH are both co-secreted from the same gene. So if there's low cortisol, the drive to the pituitary is to increase ACTH production endogenously. So when ACTH is produced endogenously, it co-secretes alpha MSH. And alpha MSH is the hormone that gives the pigment to the skin. So people who have Addison's disease generally have some tanning of the skin, especially if they're light-skinned, because of this phenomenon. So hyperpigmentation is a fairly common manifestation of primary or Addison's disease. Hyperkalemia ensues because of the destruction of the adrenal cortex. So again, remember the adrenal cortex makes both cortisol and aldosterone. So lacking aldosterone results in hypotension and hyperkalemia. And this is not a manifestation of secondary because secondary is the problem is in the pituitary itself. So in this case, ACTH production is actually decreased and therefore alpha MSH is likely decreased as well. So there's no reason for hyperpigmentation. And the problem is actually in the pituitary and not in the adrenal gland. And therefore, in secondary, there is really no problem with the aldosterone axis. And so there is no hyperkalemia. The diagnosis and the treatment is obviously dependent on the cause. So diagnosis can be easily made by the clinical symptoms and the biochemical testing that I showed you. But in some cases, you can also make the diagnosis by doing a ACTH stimulation test or what's called a cosyntropin stimulation test. So in this case, ACTH is actually injected. And when ACTH is injected, the normal response would be to increase the cortisol. But in cases of adrenal insufficiency, ACTH injections does not increase cortisol, as shown in this graphical representation. And that gives you a more conclusive diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency. For the treatment, the uh, primary causes, or in terms of Addison's disease, you would want to treat with both glucocorticoid and mineral corticoid replacement, because remember, the whole cortex is destroyed. So the usual course would be prednisone and uh, something called Florinaf, 
fluorine F is a mineral corticoid. And for the secondary, all you really are replacing is the glucocorticoid because the problem is not in the adrenal gland and therefore their aldosterone system is intact. So you don't really need to replace mineral corticoids. In the last section of the adrenal cortex, we'll cover congenital adrenal hyperplasia. These are a group of autosomal recessive disorders resulting from mutations of genes for the enzymes that are rate limiting for the various steps of adrenal steroidogenesis. So the most universally uh, common manifestation of all CAH, at least from the biochemical standpoint, is a decrease in cortisol. So all CAH forms will have a low cortisol. But depending on where the enzymatic defect is, then there is differences in the mineral corticoid levels. And so the manifestations are dependent on where the enzyme defect is. So that's why it's important to have some understanding of what the rate limiting enzymes are, as shown in this slide. The important enzyme really in this whole process um, would be 21 hydroxylase, because number one, it is the most common cause of um, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, because this is a very common enzyme that gets uh, affected. But the other two enzymes that I've listed are also important, 11 hydroxylase, 3 beta HSD, and 17 um, alpha hydroxylase. So the defects are usually preceded by the accumulation of the substrate and a decrease in the products. So this is summarized for you in the next slide showing in the table. So in, with the enzyme where 21 hydroxylase is being affected or mutated, the abnormalities that would be resulting as a consequence of this would be a low cortisol. But because 21 hydroxylase is so important, you will also have a decrease in aldosterone. And as a result of this, the pathway is shifted towards more of the uh, androgens. And as a result, androgen levels are increased. If this situation happens in a female infant, then the manifestation would be basically salt wasting and masculinization. And in fact, 21 hydroxylase is the most common cause of female ambiguous genitalia. So that's why it's a, probably a commonly tested question uh, just based on its common um, occurrence. In contrast, if you look at 11 beta hydroxylase, again, the common manifestation is low cortisol. But in this case, you will also have low aldosterone, but these kids are not going to have salt wasting because of the accumulation of another mineral corticoid called DOC or deoxycorticosterone. The deoxycorticosterone is in fact an even more potent mineral corticoid than aldosterone. And as a result of this, these kids are going to have hypertension. But again, because of the uh, increase in androgen production, in, you could have mild masculinization as well. For 3-beta-HSD, the problem is again very similar. Low cortisol, low aldosterone, and everything gets shifted over to the androgen pathway. And again, in a female uh, infant, this can be manifested as mild ambiguous genitalia with some mild salt wasting as well. And then finally, in the most extreme case, 17-alpha-hydroxylase, where the enzyme is important for the generation of all the uh, pathways, which includes aldosterone, cortisol, and androgens. What you in fact see is um, the decrease in cortisol, decrease in androgens, decrease in aldosterone, but actually an increase in the DOC uh, and as a result of it, these kids are going to be, again, very similar to 11-beta-hydroxylase, uh, will have hypertension, but they will have uh, sexual infantilism because they don't have any androgens at all. So it's important to recognize these enzymes, but of these four, 21-hydroxylase um, is by far the most common and hence uh, likely to be uh, tested on your boards, as, as illustrated here in this question. Ambiguous genitalia is most commonly due to a deficiency of which of the following enzymes in cortisol biosynthesis. And again, the answer is 21 hydroxylase. So this concludes the um, adrenal cortical regulation and the adrenal cortex section. Uh, the take home points here are the fact that um, there is both the HPA axis and the RAA axis that is in play in the cortex. It's important, re important to recognize both of these. Uh, in terms of um, aldosterone regulation, you could have hyperaldosteronemia because of primary or secondary causes.
and in terms of um, cortisol dysregulation, you could have cortisol excess resulting in Cushing's or cortisol deficiency resulting in Addison's disease. And it's important to recognize the various manifestations of congenital adrenal hyperplasia and of, of the various different enzymatic defects, the most common is 21-hydroxylase. In the next section, we'll continue with the, the theme of uh, ambiguous genitalia, but from the reproductive endocrine standpoint.